The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you for the wondrous work that you've shown us through Jesus Christ, through his work on the cross. And we ask that you would guide our eyes to him, to that cross, that we may learn from him as we bear our own crosses in our own lives. Please bless this time of Bible study with wisdom. Give us your Holy Spirit that we might hear your word and learn it. And we pray this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So we get to begin a new Bible study. Yay. How exciting. <laughs> Woo. Um, so we have finished and sort of wrapped up our Dying with Christ um, Bible study, though we might have a brief reprise later on in March to talk about finances and near death, and we'll have someone else come in to talk about that because I don't know a whole lot about it. Um, but what I do get to tell you about more that I do know maybe a little bit more about is our new study, which is about the theology of the cross, the theology of the cross. So not just the theology of the cross of Christ, you know, classic, you know, Christian focus, we, we talk about Jesus, his death, his resurrection, but also the cross in our own lives. So we even get to hear more about that. Conveniently, pastor's sermon this morning talks about Christ, the cross of Christ, as well as the own cross that he tells us that we are to carry each day. It's so appropriate how these things sort of just work together, don't they? <laughs> how about that? All right, so I am going to share my screen and talk my way through this so I know what I'm doing. Otherwise, I'll forget. So the theology of a cross, we're starting with the very, very <laughs> start of even just the question of like, what is a Christian? And just starting there to try and build outward towards our own crosses that we bear and what that means, what that looks like. So what is a Christian? A Christian is someone who trusts in and follows the same God that Jesus talks about in the gospel, the same God that Jesus prays to, that we see him interacting with and talking about in the gospels and building out from there, looking at the apostles that Jesus sent. Who do the apostles speak about, follow, and trust in? That is the same God that we today, we as Christians, I need to stand in front of this, otherwise you can't hear me on Zoom. I want to walk around. It's my, I want to pace. Um, but this same God from, well, time before time, you know, before creation to now into everlasting, the same God who Jesus himself prayed to who is Jesus himself, that is what makes a Christian is our trusting in and following that God. So then we are, we here are probably not just Christians, but most of us here, I think, are Lutherans too. So then what is a Christian? Okay, we got that. Now let's pare it down to what is a Lutheran? To quote a seminary professor, it is a right way of being Christian. <laughs> However, and we don't want to like push other people to the fringe to say that, because I want to use one of Jesus's own metaphors and analogies when talking about the path of life and the path of destruction. Wide is the path towards death. It is a wide path that much of the world follows, and narrow is the path to life, to eternal life with Christ. And so all Christians 
all Christians find themselves on that narrow path, which is good, which is great. So not just us Lutherans, but you will find Roman Catholics, Methodists, Baptists, uh, Evangelicals, Presbyterians, you know, the list goes on. You will find all of them also on the narrow path towards eternal life. But our goal is to be on that narrow path, but to also try and be centered on it so that we don't get near to the edge, almost falling off one way or the other. And so what we try to do is try to follow not just on that narrow path, but straight and narrow in the very middle as much as we can. Well, some Christians, just based on their theology of their church body, they will be closer to one edge, closer to the other. And we try to fit in that straight and narrow. We don't want to even let ourselves get close to straying off the path. So that's what I mean by a right way of being Christian. Not so much, well, we're right, you're wrong, get out of here. That's, that should not be our goal. <laughs> so then with what is a Christian, what is a Lutheran, we, it brings us sort of to then how do we stay on this sort of straight, narrow way that Christ himself has walked? And we talk about the theology of the cross. So I'll bring us to Mark 8, 34 to 38. I will resume share, or I will stop share, and then I'll have to share it with a different screen because technology. So Mark 8, 34 to 38, and calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, Jesus said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So what are we going to take from that? What is Jesus saying to his disciples? What is he saying to us today? I think one thing, first and foremost, that becomes very clear is that Christians are given a cross. That is something that you have when you become a Christian, you are also given a cross to bear. It is a consequence of being a Christian, is that we will have challenges, sufferings, difficulties that are unique to being a Christian, that are not common to everyone in this world, but are unique to those of us who live and walk on that narrow path. So that includes losing one's life, moving towards avoiding being part of the adulterous and sinful generation, and to try and take heart and even take pride in Christ and his comforts in our cross bearing. But we know that crosses are not something that feels good. Crosses are a burden. They are heavy. They are what killed our Lord Jesus Christ. And so sufferings and challenges in this world, they're those things that weigh us down. They're things that threaten to crush us. They, they threaten to crush us in many ways, too, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, in every area or arena of life, 
these things, these crosses burden us. And a cross isn't something that's taken lightly because it's a death sentence. When Jesus was given his cross to carry, it wasn't going to end in, well, maybe he'd get out of this, or maybe someone wouldn't die. When you are given your cross to carry, that's a death sentence for all those who were killed by crucifixion in Jesus' day and time in Roman occupation. You don't, you don't get to avoid that. You don't get to avoid the cross once you're given it. So Jesus tells his disciples, he tells us to uh, follow him and take up our own death sentence with him. That's, that's his words. That we take up our cross, we take up a death sentence for Christ. But so we ourselves are burdened by the cross, by our own cross that we are given. And Christ, he speaks to our burdens. He wants to not, okay, I have to stop, share, reshare, get into that habit. And we go to Matthew 11, starting at verse 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And yet Jesus says this, knowing that his burden is the cross and death. He says this, with the full knowledge that he is going to die, he is going to take upon all the sins of the world, all of our sins, onto his body and be crucified in the flesh. And yet he says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light, and that is what we take upon ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we have this strange tension between these two ideas of the hardship and burdens of the crosses in our lives, of the challenges and difficulties we face for being a Christian, whether it be just in general disliked, persecuted for being a Christian, or treated poorly, differently, or because we have to limit ourselves in the things that we do, that we can't join the world in the revelry that they would like. These are things that we'd consider burdensome in many ways, but we hold that intention with the fact that Christ says that his burden and his yoke is easy and light. And he gives that to us. He gives us spiritual rest and comfort. He is the only solution and the only comfort to the burden of the cross. And also, only those who are burdened need this comfort that he's given. Because he's saying all who labor, all who are heavy laden, if you're one who sees yourself as unburdened or trying not to, or not heavy laden, if you are trying to throw away and hide away the challenges of life, to throw burdens away, I'll try to put it in like these terms. So a lot of our burdens come from ourself and from our own sinful nature. A lot of the crosses that we have to struggle and carry with is our own doing because of our sins, of the ways that we rebel against God, of the ways that we bring trouble upon ourselves with our own sinfulness. That is something that burdens us, that gives us trouble and pain in this world. However, for those who are, who do not feel burdened by their own sin, to those who do not, who aren't bothered by transgressing God's law, 
or in, in other words, to those who are lawless, to those who even affirm everything as an okay action, which is what the world around us wants to and likes to do is to say that this, this, and this, well, that's okay. It's just something that happens. You don't need to be bothered by it. You don't need to feel guilty for, um, I don't know, what's, what's the moral? Uh, if it feels good, do it. Yeah, if it feels good, do it. Even if it's bad, even if it hurts other people, if it feels good, do it. And it's really not that bad. And you can just hide any guilt or shame away and throw it in the closet and lock it up and don't think about it. And there's no need to comfort well, they don't feel a need for comfort in those situations because they just sort of try to throw it away and lock it up. And I think all of us in this room, including myself, have tried to take sins, things that we are very much guilty of, be it habitual sins, be it even just like a one-time event where we have wronged others or even ourselves, and we try and throw it away in the closet or we try and like put it in a jar, stuff it, close it, hide it away forever, and yet it still sort of festers within us. What I'm trying to say is that there is no permanent comfort or permanent solution to burdens apart from what Christ gives. You have to realize that, yeah, actually, I am pretty heavy laden. I am actually someone who breaks the Ten Commandments on a daily basis. And it's to those who Jesus says, hey, come to me. I have rest for you. Yeah, that's, that is where I'm going. <laughs> um, so, we learn to embrace both the hardship and we embrace the comfort in Christ all at once. And we try to embrace it the way that Jesus did, looking at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. And this is often referred to as the great Christ hymn which talks about just his coming down. Jesus from God to man. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking up, by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord. So we want to take on that role of a servant. We don't want to struggle against the cross that we're given. If that's the consequence of being a Christian, we need to accept that challenges and suffering comes with it. Because if we try to throw away the cross, we throw away Christ with it. We throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that doesn't do. That doesn't work. So we want to be like Christ, making ourselves humbled and lowly. We want to accept the fact that we're going to have troubles and frustrations just for the sake of being a Christian. That there's going to be things that will bother us that will not bother anyone else in this world. There will be some little thing that we say or some little thing that someone else says that either causes us to hate someone in our heart or to just be burdened. And what we want to try to do then 
is to become like Jesus, humble ourselves to the cross that we are given. Because we really don't deserve to not have burdens. I will ask, um, what do we deserve? I feel like we've heard this time and time again. Art, can you tell us what we deserve? <laughs> Death, hell, and damnation. <laughs> that, that, is, that is what we deserve for our sin, for our sinfulness. From the very beginning, from Adam and Eve in Genesis, the sin that came from Adam and has been passed down generation to generation, coming all the way down to us. Man, you don't get generational gifts that pass down that far in a lineage, but that one has come to us without any issues. And so we have to realize that we don't deserve to not have a burden placed on us. Actually, we deserve much worse than just having a burden. We deserve death. But in Christ, as Christians, as people who have been given a cross to carry, we're privileged to become servants like Christ. That's not as much a difficulty as it is a privilege. Well, it's both. The cross is hard, but it is also something that is good. It makes us more and more like Christ. It brings us close to him. And oddly enough, having these burdens can be joyful. And I'm going to bring up now Philippians 4, 4 verse 4, which I hear is a favorite among a pastor in the congregation. Um, <laughs> and it is rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And this is coming from Paul, of all people, who was imprisoned who has been beaten many a time on his missionary journeys, who has been suffering as much, if not more than what he has inflicted upon the church before his conversion. This is a guy who knows what it's like to be down and then kicked half a dozen times while you're down. And he is telling us to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And the key to this is it is in the Lord. It is in Christ. It is in our salvation. It is in our life. The one who gives us life, we're able to rejoice in him because he has not only suffered the cross, but through it, he has overcome the cross and death. And that's what we look towards as people who carry the cross is looking forward to the overcoming of it, to the overcoming of this pain and the overcoming of this death, the world that we live in. And I get to move to First Peter chapter 4. And... The way that we suffer and the challenges that we have are very different from the challenges that the world has. Because if we as Christians, and only as Christians, are given a cross, then the rest of the world, if we on the narrow path have the cross, then those on the wide path, they don't have a cross but they still suffer hardships. They still have challenges. Um, let me read first Peter and then I'll say more words. Uh, believe, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice in so far as you share Christ, Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed because of the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. 
Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So, Christian suffering different than the world's suffering. There's overlap, but there's also a wide area of difference. Because I think when things like a pandemic come, both us who are Christians and the whole rest of the world, we were all suffering and all having frustrations, trials and hardships because of that. When earthquakes come, when natural disasters, when even things like death come, like a death in the family, Christian or not, that's going to hurt. When you are in dire straits financially, Christian or not, that's going to hurt. Like, everyone undergoes that. And everyone undergoes that sort of suffering, but that's not the type of cross that we're given. It doesn't sound like a great deal, but we have to live with that suffering and we're given a cross on top of that. That actually sounds like a pretty bad deal, at least by the world's standards. But what comes with the cross is Christ. So in all sufferings, there comes Christ. And the cross usually, so I'm trying to think of the best way to say this, but like when you have a death in the family, you have to try to grieve, to work through that and have the pain of having someone just cut away out of your life and that they are no longer there the hole that the the place that they filled is now empty and void and we as christians we have the additional question of why god did this happen why god did you let this person die or die in such a way but that's not where we're left. And that's not the end of that question. That's a cross to bear and it can be an additional weight. And it, can, it doesn't have to apply necessarily to the death of a loved one. It applies in every situation, every suffering that we undergo. We have to have that additional question of why did this happen? If God, you are so loving, why did this happen to me? So we suffer not only a loss, but we suffer additionally wondering where God might be. And that is, that is the cross. That is the negative and the hard. But with the cross, there is always Christ. There is always the answer. It is its own problem. It is its own answer. Because in the cross, when we look to the cross, we see the one who died and suffered all things for our sake so that we might live. He suffered all hell, all pain, and in every way that is humanly imaginable so that we might live. So he understands our suffering. He walks with our suffering, and he gives us rest and peace because we are heavy laden with the cross that we're given. Um, and it's in ourself, though, we, it's, we, we deal then with the old Adam and the new Adam. And I want to go to Romans 3 for that starting at verse 10, going through 18. I am not sharing this. I am now. <laughs> so as it is written, no one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God, all have turned aside. 
Together they become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood and their paths are ruin and misery and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So that the no one is righteous, no, not one. So ever since, you know, the beginning with Adam and Eve, the curse that gets passed all the way down to us today, that these verses, this description lives within us as Christians. But also within us as Christians, we have an entirely new remade person, someone who has been baptized and washed clean, someone who has been made new and sinless. So if I say to a Christian, you're perfect, and I can say that to all of you here, that you are perfect, that's actually a true statement, just as much as you are an awful sinner. And we have these two fighting influences within us that view the cross so very differently. One of us saying that, oh my goodness, I can't deal with the pain and the suffering and the, just the frustration that comes along with being a Christian. And that's the old Adam within us, the Adam, the sinful self that doesn't want to conform to Christ. And then there's the new man within us, the regenerated person, us who have been reborn in Christ, who says, thank you. God for everything that he has done. Thank God for the privilege to be united with Christ in his suffering. And we just live with ourselves in that nice dynamic tension where we go back and forth, even on the daily, even moment to moment with the way that we view our life. We'll be both frustrated by it and then thankful for the way that God works through it. Um, so our battle surrounding our own cross is primarily wrapped up in fighting ourselves, our doubts and our failures to trust in Christ, and then the great times when we have full confidence and assurance in him. So within ourself, we naturally want to put our will, our desires first, if only everything went our way in the world, then everything would be fine. And even just like in wider society, that is the way that things work. It's like you want, oh, how do I say this? So every person wants their will to be done. No one naturally wants to say, God, thy will be done, as we do each, each time we come together for worship. Each time we say the Lord's Prayer, we say, thy will be done. The natural person, those, the old Adam within us, that sinful nature, does not want to say, thy will be done. It wants to say, my will be done. Thank you very much. And oftentimes I would like to push other people's will out of the way because my will be done, not your will, not your will, not your will, my will be done. And now if that's the whole world, our world seems to work pretty well in spite of that. You know, not everyone is just selfishly trying to, I don't know, steal from their neighbors all the time to get more and more of what they want or anything like that. People end up working together. They put on a nice smile and a nice face so that, well, their will can be done eventually. I will suffer this just a little bit so that I can get what I want in the end. Because you don't want to have to suffer at the hands of anyone else's will. Um, but that, that is the way that the self works. That is the way that we want to work. And the cross entirely denies that. Jesus's cross, our own cross, denies that desire. And 
I think um, we can be tempted to wonder. We can be tempted to wonder like about our cross, but we can be tempted to wonder about the cross of Jesus if he truly suffered and underwent the same sort of pain that we go through as well. Um, like, can Christ truly understand our suffering? Can he truly be a balm to the soul in our own situation? Can he deal with our, the ways that we have failed, the ways that we are also in pain? And I'll move to Luke 22, starting at verse 39. And Jesus came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So, even though from the very beginning, Jesus was slated to win out against Satan, he was slated to go to the cross, and everything was going to be said, done, people are going to be saved, sins are going to be atoned for. Jesus understands the pain and suffering of the cross, even to the point where he sweats blood, even where he, to the point where he asks his own heavenly father to take this cup, take this suffering away from me, if it be your will. Jesus is our ultimate role model when it comes to our life as Christians, our life looking towards the cross, our life looking towards our own cross, because in the end, he suffers. And he, I, I think this is worth saying is that he doesn't suffer in the same way that we do, where a lot of our fighting is us just trying to fight our own <laughs> internal battle against sin he didn't have to do that he fought our sin not his own sin he didn't have that internal struggle but he had to set himself against everything else the entire world the sins of all people and that's what he had to go through. That's what he had to suffer for. He didn't suffer because of anything on his own. We make ourselves, I don't know, we give ourselves a hard time enough as it is, but Jesus didn't give himself a hard time. He took on a hard time for our sake. And he suffered worse than all of us will. And he understands then, our pain. He understands our cross. He gives us then a light yoke, an easy burden because of the comfort that he gives. And so then that should give us the ability to bear our own cross. That should give us the gospel comfort that we can live our life as Christians. But there are going to be times where we don't really want to deal with our own Christian suffering, where we feel that our sins might become too great, or that we don't want to repent. Those are the two ways that we as Christians, we are tempted to avoid the cross, the times where we are tempted to just throw it off of our shoulders and say, you know, I don't want to deal with this. It's the times where we either want to act more like a self-righteous Pharisee and say, that's not a sin, that's not a problem, 
or we want to be a despairing Judas, where we are in despair, lose all hope for forgiveness, and turn away from Christ. So we have those two avenues that we're tempted to take. And yet, that's part of why we come to worship. That's part of why we come to the church. For those who are the self-righteous Pharisee, the person who says, I have done no wrong. Don't you dare accuse me of doing wrong. That's why we go, that's why we start our worship service with confession. We start saying, I, a poor, miserable sinner, or I confess unto thee all of my iniquities and transgressions. We have to come before God and we do say that we're a sinner. We break that down so that we can carry that cross again. And for those of us who are in despair and hopelessness, that's where absolution comes. That's where hearing the word of God, that he has forgiven you all of your sins. He's taken everything upon himself and that you can receive absolution, that you can hear his word, that you can receive communion. Both of those avenues get closed off as we come to worship so that we can take up our cross and daily follow him. So that when our challenges in life seem too great to bear, we return to the place where he gives his gifts so that we can continue each day to walk out the faith that we've been given so that we can live on that narrow path. Um, and this, if this felt like sort of a scattering, a spattering of a Bible study, well, it might have been. We're going to narrow down as, I'm trying to just give a brief overview of the theology of the cross. And as we keep going on week after week, it should narrow down and we'll get into some more pinpoint um, discussion and topic. Anyways. <sighs> Victor, um, you know, it's really tough. We sit here and watch the word of God, but yesterday in our basis of the faith, the last hour and a half, we went to the Ten Commandments, and Jesus was 33 years old and went to the cross, and I can't get out of this chair and not break the Ten <laughs> Sitting through that baby the face yesterday, it's like I can't even move. We're not really breaking. <laughs> <laughs> you are forgiven. It just makes me burning the cross. It's like everyday life. I hate burning the cross. Like all employees getting away with stuff. I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that is, that's like the perfect description. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so, but he was 33 years old and he didn't break the hands. No, not even one. Not even a single thing. And that reminds me of just like one thing that like Luther wrote in 1518, whatever, whatever. And it is he had this whole thing of theses. And one of the things that really sticks out to me was, although the works of man always seem attractive and good, they're nevertheless likely to be mortal sins. So us getting up out of our chair to like maybe even do a nice deed is nevertheless more than likely a mortal sin. Are you kidding me? And that's frustrating. It's <laughs> so frustrating. And yet people get away with worse and don't feel a mite bad about it at all. It, it makes me cringe when people say, oh, I've done nothing wrong. I don't need forgiveness for anything. And if you know anything about, you're like, okay, I know, as a matter of public record, they're divorced a couple of times. Um, I give a big long list of things you should be feeling needing forgiveness for. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> and that, that's, that's just part of like our pain as people who bear the cross because we like 
feel all the splinters in our back and it just pokes at us and tells us exactly where we've done wrong. Exactly. Every little thing. And yet at the same time, it's exactly what we need because it also brings us the ultimate satisfaction for our sins. The, it brings us Christ. And last word from Tom, and then we'll pray and end it. I'll make it quick. Okay, real quick. But I, I really enjoyed uh, when you were talking about Christ. The cross before really was not for itself, but for us. And, and for the sins of the whole world. And so it's important for us to remember that our, our cross is not always about us. Our, our, our person of the cross is about everybody. And so our family and our friends and, and our co-workers and so forth. And we make sure we put them down. Oh, I love that. Didn't hear it. Yes, that that is part of it. That is part of it. We can't do it. Not not even any bit as close to as much as Jesus did it. But the things, the little splinters that you know poke us as we carry our cross, sometimes point us towards our neighbor, towards caring for them. Yes, that is good. All right, let us close with the Lord's Prayer, and we will say, Thy will be done. And the Lord be with you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. Go in peace and serve the Lord.